Welcome back. You're watching Gravitas. Our next big discussion of the day, tanks, armored vehicles, and more than 6,000 troops of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, are being amassed along the European Eastern Front. Reports suggest that the troop buildup on the other side, that is along the Rus Russian border uh, to Western Europe, are at least five times as much in numbers. Relations between the United States and Russia have been on the downside. But is the standoff over the war against ISIS the only reason for this new hostility between the global superpowers? Senior international correspondent Padma Rao has this report. They're calling it the enhanced forward presence, a routine military exercise to express solidarity with each other. But the massive build-up of troops by member states of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, along Europe's eastern borders began months ago. And it seems much more than a mere expression of brotherhood. 2,800 U.S. weapons and 4,000 troops are being stationed in Poland. They will be joined by at least 3,000 troops from other NATO member states like Germany and Canada in the former Soviet republics of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. In Litauen werden wir im Rahmen der NATO-Bündnissolidarität ein starkes Zeichen der Entschlossenheit des NATO-Bündnisses setzen. Insgesamt werden wir innerhalb dieser sechs Monate, wo wir in Litauen sind, zahlreiche Übungen zusammen. The Baltic states look forward to the long-term NATO troop presence. After all, reports suggest that there are 330,000 troops stationed along their other eastern borders, those belonging to the other big neighbor, Russia. Russia's belligerent annexation of Ukraine's Crimea Peninsula in 2014 and support for pro-Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine plunged relations between NATO and Moscow into the deepest frost since the end of the Cold War in 1991 and the tiny Baltic republics into uncertainty, prompting a plea address to Washington and NATO for help. The decision was made uh, to do what's called European Reassurance Initiative. This is part of that plan. These forces here were in direct response to the destabilizing efforts of the Russian government in the Ukraine. Germany's enthusiasm for this initiative is rather surprising. After all, the German anathema for the presence of troops on their territory is well known. They have experienced it for most of the seven decades since the end of World War II. Canada, too, is known as an advocate for a weapons-free world. So is this initiative really about human values, or is it more about control over the oil and gas pipelines that flow from Russia through Ukraine to Europe? Russia is the world's largest supplier of energy, and Europe is one of its most important consumer. And of late, Russia has been threatening to turn off those taps. Given the deteriorating relations between the United States and Russia, even over conflicts elsewhere, like in Syria, Analysts warn that such an eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation may result in a small provocation sparking off a conflict along the NATO's eastern flank in the coming year. The Cold War between the West and the former Soviet Union resulted in the erection of the Berlin Wall as a symbol of that mistrust. Now, it's a new iron curtain being drawn between the erstwhile enemies all over again. But if deferring political ideologies and competition for military and nuclear supremacy caused the first, this time it may be energy, the new world's biggest and most urgent need. Padma Rao, Beyond. Joining me from the newsroom is Padma. Padma, a massive troop build up like this after so many decades of disarmament in Europe. What do you make of it? Yes, Rohit. As you know, U.S. troops are deployed in more than 150 countries around the world, including in Central and South Asia. But other than in countries like Afghanistan or Syria, they're not really in active combat everywhere. So merely the deployment of troops I don't necessarily see as leading to war. But yes, the situation along that particular border where they are uh, amassed uh, along the border to Russia is uh, certainly quite tense, as is the relationship between the two countries and between the NATO and Russia. Sure. Thank you, Padma. Uh, to discuss this story further, I have with me Achal Kumar Malhotra, former ambassador of India to Armenia. He joins me from Gurgaon in near Delhi. And Daniel Dylan Bomer is the editor for Foreign Desk, The Wealth from Germany. And Beyond's London Bureau Chief, Mandy Clark. Also joins me live, 
Now, thank you all uh, for joining me this evening. Ambassador Malhotra, let me start by asking you. There are reportedly 30,000 troops there on the Russian side amassed along its western border. Is there a rather, is this a rather large number? What is the intention here? Uh, well, if you look at the current scenario, you know, this is not a result, in my opinion, of any event or development which may have taken place in the recent uh, past. I think this uh, war games in Europe, as you are saying, these probably started soon after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the crux of the problem lies in NATO's eastward expansion, countered by Soviet, I'm sorry, countered by the Russian aggression. Russian aggression. And it has, you know, in the initial years of the collapse, probably Russia was not in a position or a strong position to counter any measures taken by the NATO uh, in the direction of their eastward expansion. But when, uh, by the time they came to a position of, uh, you know, uh, deployment of uh, missile uh, defense shield in Poland, Russia under Putin had gathered enough strength to counter it. And thereafter, there has been never a stop to this ongoing buildup, or the ongoing confrontation, which is expressed in terms of, uh, you know, NATO's expansion on one side, and Russia's deployment of lethal weapons on in Kaliningrad and their show of strength in other areas like war with Georgia or more recently in 2014 what they did in Crimea. So it is a two-way affair and it, it doesn't augur well for anyone for that matter. Sure. Sure. And I think it's a, it's a matter of serious concern. And... Uh, uh, Sure. Probably it may not lead to uh, any war in the near future, uh, sure. but this kind of a build-up is best avoidable. Sure. Daniel, Germany has seen heavy Allied troop and missile presence, but also Soviet's presence on its soil for the most of seven decades since the end of the World War II. How does the common man in Germany feel about the country sending 1,000 troops to the Baltic states for a routine exercise? Well, first of all, good evening to you, Rohit. Um, that's a very good question. I, if I look at my fellow countrymen, uh, I could say that uh, I've rarely seen such a contradictory mood here. On the one hand, you have um, in the re most recent polls um, some 81% of Germans who are in favor of better relations with Russia and who are, I think, um, somewhat concerned about the um, international scenario becoming so more full of tension. On the other hand, you have some almost 50% of Germans who regard Russia as a threat. Um, so if I would sum that up, um, Germans um, are wearying of that tension building up, but they have made the historical um, experience that even though you need to find a way to come to terms with Russia, you can only do so from a position of power. So I do think that there is some understanding for the need to strengthen the eastern neighbors within the European Union. And if you take those latest troop deployments, um, in many respects, they are far behind what the East Europeans actually wanted from NATO. They wanted more troops. They wanted permanent stationments. And but now we see rotating troops. So it is from the Western side. Um, a show of force. I think it's also um, an American administration uh, that is going out and that wants to show a last strong stand in the face of Russia. Um, but of course, we don't know what will happen after January 20th, and then the game will be all new in the east of Europe. And even though I don't see a war coming up, I think there is a heightened danger of conflagration because both sides don't know each other very well. Sure. Decision makers don't know each other very well. And we have separatists and informal militant groups on the ground who might try, who might be tempted to play their own game. Sure. Uh, Ambassador Malhotra, is Russia likely to feel threatened by this NATO exercise or are they already aware 
that this unfolds and they have already been beefing up their presence. Well, surely Russia is concerned and concerned not from today, from the day NATO has started expansion. You know, soon after uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, as I mentioned earlier, the space that was vacated by the Soviet Union, NATO and the Western world has tried to, you know, somehow or the other occupy it. Fine, they wanted to introduce uh, institutions of democracy and, uh, you know, the democratic values and so on and so forth. But side by side, uh, probably this would have been uh, tolerable as far as uh, Russia is concerned. Probably Russia wouldn't have mind. Uh, but the moment it came to a question of, uh, you know, the, the uh, military buildup right next door, uh, right on the border of uh, Russia, from that day onwards, Russia has been concerned. And it has been, I, and it seems to have adopted a two-pronged strategy. Number one, it, it has been aggressive. It has been uh, deploying lethal uh, weapons in Kaliningrad, uh, which is a strategic location as far as the East European uh, countries are concerned. Sure. And at the same time, it has also shown aggression in terms of, you know, annexing Crimea or uh, waging a war against uh, Georgia, or fighting a war with Georgia. So I think Russia has been on the alert right from the beginning. Sure. Fine. First 10 years, they were not in a position to do much. Now, under Putin onwards, in the last 10, 15 years, they are in a position to do something and they are doing it and they will sure. continue to do that. Sure. And That's I think it is high time that both sides, instead of seeing each other eye to eye, ball, eyeball to eye, eye, rather than sit down and uh, work according to NATO's uh, declared objective of preventing conflicts rather than, uh, you know, creating conflicts. Having Surely. dialogue while showing strength. Surely. So I think it's, it's, the time has come that they, 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 they better, you know, stop now. Also, Russia showed its might when uh, it certainly uh, was in Ukraine. And we've seen that movement. Let me bring in Mandy Clark here. Mandy, let us look at the bigger picture with you here. Uh, Turkey has not been admitted to the EU, but is a member of NATO. Is Turkey also going to participate in this exercise ostensibly to protect the small Baltic republics that feel threatened by Russia? Well, at the minute, the relationship with Turkey and NATO is very sensitive um, after the failed military coup. Now, that was a coup that NATO certainly didn't support, uh, but it has led to a stalling of uh, joint exercises. Turkey, you must um, know that it has the biggest military in all of Europe, in NATO. The only bigger one is um, the United States. So the alliance is certainly very keen to keep um, Turkey within NATO. Now, Turkey might provide a supporting role for the, this um, mission. However, Turkey has pointed out they have their own problems with Russia at the Black Sea, and they have described the Black Sea as slowly becoming a Russian lake because of the Russian military posts that are being built up along that border. So certainly they want a similar strategy in that region as well. But at the minute, the relationship is sensitive, and uh, it will be seen if Turkey will provide some support to it. Mandy, what about the UK? It is a member of NATO too. Is it also sending troops? Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, Britain has upped its commitment. It uh, initially offered 500 troops, and then just in October, it has added an additional 800 troops. It's one of the four countries that will be leading the battle groups. So that's the United States, Germany, Britain, and Canada. Uh, it very much sees itself at the center of NATO. And at the center of this mission, Britain has been quite wary of uh, Russians' intent in the um, Eastern Front. So it is playing a leading role in this mission. Danielle, what is the public mood about Russia's annexation of the Crimean Palestina? And about Putin as well, you know? How do they feel about Putin? In Germany. Um, I would say the annexation of Crimea, that's a point where Germans have differing views. There is um, actually in Germany, if you compare it to other European countries, a stronger uh, sense of uh, we need to understand um, Russia's historical claim to Crimea, which uh, 
was actually uh, part of a Russian Soviet Republic until uh, the 1960s. Um, we also have to understand uh, the historical claim Russia has to Ukraine because uh, Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, was actually the cradle of the Russian nation. I think Germans have, a, uh, have more understanding for that Russian view. But I think um, now uh, the way Germans look at Putin and at Russia is more um, determined by the elections here coming up. We have seen uh, those apparent uh, attempts at manipulating the American elections. Uh, there could be similar cases in Germany. And we have the attempts by Russia to uh, strengthen right populist, uh, racist, anti-migration parties all over Europe, and that includes Germany. And I think that's something that many Germans are concerned about. Um, and that concern is growing as the elections in fall are coming closer. Ambassador Malhotra, let me bring you in on also the Indian perspective into this. Now, in the last two decades, we almost saw a unipolar world. The United States was making most of the decisions. It was almost about six or seven years ago, we saw Russia again stand up and begin taking a stance. From the early 90s till about five, six years ago, Russians almost had gone out of the game. Uh, what's changing here? Does India need to be worried about what's going on between NATO and Russia? Well, right. I think any situation of conflict, whether it is between USA or Russia, whether it is between NATO on the one hand and uh, Russia on the other hand, does not augur well for the overall stability of the world, including uh, it is not in the interest of India. Now, with Russia, we, I think, for the past two, three, at least for the past two years, we are ourselves not sure where do we stand with Russia. You know, Russia moving slightly towards uh, China and uh, uh, Pakistan, this Russia-China-Pakistan axis coming up is also something which is a matter of concern to us. Now, Donald Trump, which way will he go, whether he will extend hands of friendship with uh, President Putin? or will he uh, adopt some different uh, strategy will be seen only over a period of time. If you go by his yesterday's uh, press conference, he said, I don't know. People are saying that I'd, I may get along well with Putin. I don't know. Maybe yes. So he uh, is still keeping uh, under the sleeves what he has in mind as far as Russia is concerned. And he's also undergoing lots of uh, you know trouble on account of the supposedly uh, the role which Russia had played in the defeat of Hillary or uh, the, the, the compromising uh, information that Russia has got uh, as far as uh, uh, Donald Trump is concerned. So I think we have to very carefully watch which way this alignment or realignment is going to take place over a period of next six to eight months. But I'll repeat myself uh, when I say that any conflict between these uh, big powers is not going to augur well for the rest of the humanity. And we hope and uh, we should uh, look towards a solution situation when they will be able to, you know, sit, sit together and uh, work out uh, the whatever misperceptions uh, mispercep uh, or distrust they have for each other. Sure. You know, sure. Uh, it makes sense for NATO to enhance sure. its uh, presence in uh, sure. East Europe because they are committed to, to, to uh, provide security to its members. Uh, with it, this makes sense that it also makes sense sure. that Russia, you know, enhances its own military uh, strength on the, in Kaliningrad and other parts of the world. I am but with you, this, Dr. Uh, Ambassador so Malhotra, on this. show of strength, it is all I'm, right. I'm with you. I'm with you when you say, uh, Danielle, you brought up slightly earlier in the discussion, January 20th. This may all change the whole relationship, the way it's structured your closing thoughts uh, as we wind up this debate. Well, I can only um, pick up the cue that the ambassador just gave me. Um, I see all those concerns and I share them. And I think the um, 
best perspective that we have here, and maybe that's a particularly German experience, is that if we look back at the 1980s and parts of the 70s now, many Germans feel that in a way, the Cold War um, offered a strong uh, sense of stability, yeah. after all, because you knew who was at the helm. Those people could sit together and put some order into the world. And if this is what those supposedly self-declared strongmen in Moscow and Washington achieve, then they ought to be thanked for that. Uh, Mandy, let me ask you, the whole relationship between the EU and the interests of the EU. How is it going to change after Brexit? Because that certainly uh, has been a turning point in the relationship. I think Britain has made it very clear that um, even though they're going to plan to exit the EU, they are still strongly committed to NATO. They see this as their top military strategy. Um, it is the, the, the only, Brit the British military could not protect itself without the strength of NATO. It's one of the few countries that um, pay its share. So recently Donald Trump said that most of the members of NATO are not paying the 2% uh, GDP that needs to be put in. Uh, Britain has been doing it. It's, it has showed financially its commitment to NATO. It's put in its troop numbers. And it certainly in the future has made it quite clear that this is their military strategy going forward. Great. Thank you, Mandy, for giving us this perspective. Thank you, Ambassador Malotra, and thank you, Daniel, for joining us to understand this. Now, to get a real sense of what's happening there in Europe. On one side, there are Russian troops. On the other side, Eastern Europe. Now, it is getting a tremendous amount of troops from all the NATO countries. Uh, the NATO countries is a grouping of countries that protects parts of Europe and certainly a grouping between France and the United States and the UK. Now the challenge is going to be that will this escalate into a war or will all of this change on January 20th when Trump comes into power and he decides he wants to have good relations with Russia and not look at Russia as an adversary. But the games are larger. There are lots of oil interests in Eastern Europe. There are lots of oil interests in the Middle East. And this is far from over until we can call it that. That is all we have in this edition of Gravitas. News and updates continue on Beyond when we return. This is me, Rohit Gandhi, signing off. Good night and good luck.